you. Your turn, Eve. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you always, San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, if this is your first time, or maybe you have just not refreshed your interest in just the amazing arising of individuals who make this possible. This is a completely volunteer run center. Uh, we as teachers are so fortunate that we get to show up really um, out of the generosity of those who make it possible. So that generosity hopefully will invite us into the space here together. And before we begin our sit, I wanna mention that the objectives, the goals of the San Francisco Dharma Collective is to create this space together, of course, virtually now, and hopefully at some time in the future, together in person, that feels welcoming. That feels as though we prioritize and value a sense of care for one another. And that care really, hopefully, informs our compassionate listening and our compassionate speech. Inadvertently, we can sometimes not notice that actually our mind, our thoughts, and even our words may come out in ways that could be harsh towards others. And of course, in this evening together, mostly we're going to sit, maybe there'll be a bit of chat, maybe some of you will actually give reflections out loud. And as we engage in that shared space together to really think of these important guidelines to keep us in a place where we can enact the values of meditation, of compassion. So when you're listening to someone speak or seeing a, a chat arise, really holding that space with compassionate listening. And if it's something that feels off to you in a way of, God, I wouldn't say it that way, or wow, they just seem really upset, to kind of be aware and you know engage with this practice of non-harming at the deepest way possible. And when the radical non-harming arises, we see that we don't want to have any way in which we're kind of diminishing or putting down others or ourselves, right? We raise our hand or put something in the chat and then we have a feeling of regret. So how can we together exercise this quality of non-harming as we come into this shared space and this Sangha, you know, community during this time of the pandemic, it has just been so revealed in its value and importance. And I too, just deeply benefit from being together. And I'm so grateful we've had such a beautiful time here um, in our collection of, um, of beings. And, and we really have managed to be quite kind and understanding for one another through quite a lot. So with that spirit, we will keep going in our conversations this evening with that compassion, with that deep commitment to non-harming. And we'll move into our first practice of the night, which will be a settling of the mind in its natural state. So begin by really finding a posture that works for you. And as His Holiness the Dalai Lama often does, you know, maybe leaning all the way to one side and then leaning all the way to the other and then finding really what is the center that feels balanced. And then maybe you also wanna lean a little bit forward lean a little bit back and really find that sweet spot where there's a natural sense of being supported and upright. It's not just that being upright, you know, aesthetically looks good in our practice. It actually supports what's often called in the traditions as the central channel. This area that goes from the perineum all the way up to our crown, in which it is said we can bring heaven down to earth. So feeling the dignity and the sacredness of this upright posture. And for many of us who are sitting all day, let's begin with a bit of compassion towards ourselves by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears, exhaling them down the back. And twice more, inhaling our shoulders up to our ears. Exhaling down the back. One more time. Invite a softening through the muscles in the face.
invite a slight lift up from the chest as though there were an invisible thread from the heart to the ceiling or to the stars above. Invite that same softening and ease through the belly. Begin by settling the body in its natural state, inviting the quality of stillness. Allow the simple stillness of just being seated to really inform the mind, merging or mixing this stillness of the body with the stillness and presence of mind. Now that we've begun settling the body in this quality of stillness, we invite ourselves to settle the speech, the inner narrative, connecting to the silence of inner speech. can be helpful to settle this inner speech by engaging with a light practice of mindfulness of breathing, allowing the steadiness and natural rhythm of the breath to help us focus and release our planning, our reminiscing, our fantasies, 
ideas and images. As we follow this natural rhythm of the breath, we invite a quality of settling the mind. Feel or imagine luminescence, openness, clarity. This natural purity of the mind is sometimes described as a beautiful clear pond. And of course, throughout the day, maybe there are ripples of wind, disturbances of emotions or thoughts. Maybe some of the mud on the bottom, our old memories or habits gets kicked up. But if we let it be just as it is, and that pond naturally settles. And that clarity, that transparency naturally emerges and arises. So for a couple more moments here, settling our body, our speech and our mind in their natural states. See if you get a glimpse of that primordial purity, that clarity and tranquility. And to support us in further steadying the mind, we'll engage in this practice of counting our breath. At the very top of the inhale, just before the exhale, silently and softly to ourselves, we begin the count with one. And we invite ourselves to count up to 21, right at the top of the inhale and before the exhale. And if, which is very likely, our mind gets caught up in distraction of any kind, we simply start the count over. If we never make it past three, there's no problem. We're really developing an awareness of our thoughts, our fantasies, our images, right as they are carrying us away. <clears throat> So we'll engage in a round of breathing with this counting up to 21 breaths. <clears throat> Keeping in mind the focus is not counting itself, but the breath.
If the mind feels dull, lethargic, exhausted, give yourself a bit more attention to the inhale, inviting in that quality of brightness. If the mind feels busy, agitated all over the place, focus a bit more on the exhale and releasing, continuing with the counting gently, the very top of the inhale just before the exhale. We now shift our attention away from this more solid focus into one area of the breath. <clears throat> and we expand. It is as though we were cutting the cord on a bale of hay. And once cut, the hay just completely falls to the side and opens. We now cut the cord opening the expansiveness of our awareness. Gently, softly, allowing the eyes to be partially open. As we settle the mind into its natural state, we no longer need to push away any thought but we also don't energize any thought without grasping, without any kind of aversion. We allow the thoughts, the memories, the images to arise as though they were a cloud passing through the sky. Reconnecting to our posture, that dignity, that clarity and uprightness of our central channel, our spine. While inviting the ease <clears throat> and relaxation through the face, the chest and the belly. Settling our mind requires a profound relaxation and looseness of the body.
loosening and relaxing in the body. And vividly and brightly observing the motion of thoughts as they pass through while resting in the stillness of our own awareness. We could imagine ourselves facing all of the thoughts as though we were a hawk facing into the wind, staying steadily in place. Allow the thoughts, the memories, the images, no matter how many to keep passing by, moving through us like the wind, as we remain steady, present, Gently allowing the eyes to close once again. And returning to a mindfulness of breathing. Noticing tactile sensations throughout the body associated with breath.
Before we transition to the next phase of practice, consider a motivation tonight, an intention, an aspiration. You can draw upon the very decision to be here together. What value does that represent for you? In what way does that move you towards a purpose? Consider a word or phrase that captures a motivation and intention for this evening, something related to our underlying values and goals. And softly, silently, repeat it to yourself making it truly come alive. Before we begin the next phase of our evening, take a moment right here to just notice the quality of your mind, the quality of your body, and the quality of your heart. Thank you for your practice, everyone. Any questions, reflections, comments for those of us who've been sitting together for a little while now, we've been settling our mind in its natural state for about I guess four or five months. So it should be almost still completely impossible, but maybe there's a glimmer of something slightly different. So would love to hear any thoughts, reflections or questions on your practice tonight. And you can absolutely do so in the chat or raising your hand. I see a hand, please. I see two hands, <laughs> Diane and I saw uh, Sylvia as well. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Well, it was unbelievable uh, what happened while I was meditating tonight with you and with everybody else. My mind went to the ocean. Mm to the Caribbean Ocean. And I was swimming there, which that happened to us for many years because we were living there. And there were some fishes that if you stepped on them, they 
electrify you. <laughs> totally. You mostly had to go to the hospital. Hmm. And it was really scary. But you couldn't help going in into the water because the water was and to swim there was, was paradise. But life is like that. I mm. mean, it's paradise. And then if you step into that, you, you can die. <laughs> mm. So I don't know why uh, now with what is happening. And I've never experienced that sort of feeling and fear and desperation that now with this uh, pandemia, the last year in my life. And uh, it's also so good to see that everybody's alive and happy and having their drinks and especially listening to you, Eve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, beautiful. It is, it's so interesting and understudied, this incredible inner eye, this imaginative eye. And, you know, I do think that some of these imaginative um, experiences we have in meditation is a real loosening of the mind, right? The rigid, focused mind is not having visionary daydreams. We know that creativity and mindfulness co-occur. We don't understand quite what that is, right? And, and I think um, for many, I've had this experience for, and for many of us on retreat, we start to actually, or in deep practice, we start to familiarize with a language that is more based in image than in word. So we can have an experience in which we aren't describing it. It's actually arising for us in this different language. So I, I really invite that. It doesn't have to be like, oh no, that's a distraction, right? We can really open ourselves to these different um, ways of, especially with settling the mind, because there is that loosening. So, thank you. And I see Diane. Hi, Diane. So um, there's a lot of synergy. I've been going to a lot of teachings since the pandemic began, because there's wonderful things offering. So appreciate this time. And I noticed in a lot of the teachings, the teachers talked about the resting in it, whatever it is. And, um, and then I went to MC Owen, he gave a, a, a course on the paramitas. And when he got to Diana, he was, he was like, an, like there's, I didn't realize there's 10 elements to each paramita. Oh my goodness. But when the Diana one, an element is the relaxation. Mm. And then um, I trained as a student of um, Tenzin Wenyo Rinpoche. He's always, and I noticed you're going to give a, you mentioned you're going to give a teaching with him and he is way into um, resting in the spaciousness of being. Yeah. And he teaches this Tibetan Buddhist yoga, which I've been practicing for a, a little while, quite faithfully. And I'm taking another class with him in it because I want to even know even more. And he talked about how, and I just kind of wondered what you read on this, because you're all up in like the new neuroscience and all, um, about how he goes, you know, he's, he has a lot to say or help has helped me with the discursive thinking, that bad broadcast that I believe and get hooked into and get all jacked up. And it's just like, wait, you know, you know, and just how to be, but he talks about how it, it how the healing is in the spaciousness. It's not the mind that's going to figure anything out. And, and just, you know, so when you, I, when you started teaching us about, and you and Lopan Chandra about, you know, getting, being in the, the spaciousness of being, relaxing into that spaciousness. That may, anyway, I've just been working with that lately because he, mm -hmm. he gave us some homework to when this, <laughs> these thoughts arise that are so compelling and make me so unhappy and just hook me to just stop and breathe rest, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So is that where the, I, I and mean, that was my interpretation that that's really where the magic happens, even though yeah. I know, I know I will never forget slogan number 28, abandon all hope of fruition, but, <laughs> Give up all hope of fruition. Yes. but what, you know, as much as we can end up suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so happy to hear that, um, this time has really enriched the teaching. Oh my God. That's, um, that's a wonderful reflection. And, um, I'll put his name, um, there, Tenzin. I, I 
I've actually just been introduced to his teachings in the last year mm -hmm. and um, I've been deeply moved. It's actually a, you know, a lot of his teachings are the Bon tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, which is an indigenous um, uh, actual practice that came from Tibet. And then, you know, there's a lot of intermingling with Buddhism, but that indigenous has a kind of that same resonance of other shamanic teachings I've learned where there's a lot more drawing from the elements. And I think that can be very instructive, right? So we're looking to that quality of space. I mean, you had a nickel for every time a Dharma teacher said spaciousness of mind, you would be a very rich person, right? And yet, what does that mean? Spaciousness of mind? It's, it's you know, these metaphors um, are, enormously important that they can be really challenging. So I think aligning them to, you know, some sort of natural experience, which he does so beautifully is beneficial. And you're exactly right. Um, Alan Wallace, uh, who both Chandra and I have learned from, he has this beautiful image that I think I've shared before where he says, mostly, most of us, we have our mind in knots as though it were a cobra inside of a basket. Mm. And how do you, how do you get that cobra out of knots? Well, you're not gonna put your hand in there. You're not gonna try to interfere. You just open the basket and let the cobra unwind itself. And that's the same type of metaphor for our mind that you were pointing to, that it's not as though we go in and we're like, okay, mind, I know you're always worried, but we're gonna stop that worrying and we're gonna start with positive thinking, right? <laughs> Kerosene on the fire, carrot. Instead, we, we loosen around, right? We loosen around all of those um, strategies that we have. Our mind is wonderful. We can use it for such incredible and important purposes. And sometimes we over, kind of overstress its importance and value and, and don't prioritize this kind of rest quite so much. Most of us associate rest with falling asleep, with stupor, with dullness. There is a deep rest in which we are very bright. And that's what meditation really helps us to kind of find some sort of um, real palpable sense of. If we can have a relaxation and ease and that vividness, we can actually sustain our attention without feeling drained. Caveat. I haven't been able to do that so much on my, um, on the like meetings that we have online all day, I will say that there's something about trying to attend <clears throat> through the screen and remain relaxed. I haven't quite been able to adjust to yet. And I've been really noticing it because at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I, every interaction I had was great. There was no actual <laughs> charge with it. And yet, I end the day feeling like I have been uh, attending too tightly. So I don't know if you all have had that experience of attending with relaxation. You don't feel drained at all. But when you attend tightly, you feel drained. So I'm, I'm still first person investigating how to relax more deeply with the screen. I'm not sure quite why <clears throat> it brings out that, um, that tightness. If anyone else has figured out a way, please let me know. Um, yeah. Oh, I see, is is it Leanne? Is that Leanne? I see your- Leanne, hand. yeah. Leanne. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I wanted to loop back to the question or um, to what you said in response to the first comment, which I, I also love so much, the metaphor of stepping into the ocean, but about visualization and imagery, because um, I'm a theater director and a painter. And when I did, a uh, a 10 day retreat, you know, halfway through, I was just being flooded and I kept lamentably kind of needing to force myself to like lock down or felt like, okay, I, now I get to choose between allowing the images to flood me or doing proper meditation. And if what I heard you say was not necessarily needing to discount that as distraction. And so I'm just curious what you counsel or in terms of how to, you know, how to be in right relation with, with that experience. Yes, beautifully, uh, beautifully stated that question. And, you know, different traditions have different advisements. And so I, I'm speaking more here in this kind of Vajrayana lineage in which 
um, it's, you know, there is an, not that we are always indulging in the visions and, and ideas, but they are not quite as much something that we forcefully put aside. And there are certain practices in which, um, you know, those those images, um, those experiences can arise. And as long as we aren't again getting too hooked, they can be something we really notice. I think one area that can become challenging for us, especially on retreat, is, um, gosh, I really want to write this down. I don't want to forget it. Mm -hmm. And so then we're kind of like, oh no, I need to keep remembering it. And so I, I've had a teacher, which I really appreciate, and, and it is a practice I do on retreat, say that it's okay to have a notebook because those, I don't know if this was your experience, but those phases of creativity, they, they come and go. It's not necessarily that you're having that creative experience throughout the entire retreat. There might be a day or even an afternoon in which it comes. And so to have a notebook to just jot down a word or two and then be able to relax. Um, of course, there is that fine balance between we are engaging in just kind of fantasy and it is a distraction, but I, I really, um, you know, I, I really always want to encourage each of us to kind of be our own best investigator of what is wholesome and what is good in our practice. I so appreciate the teachings and the, um, and the, um, you know, sometimes restrictions and suggestions of, of what we should and shouldn't do on retreat. And ultimately, right, it, it's up to us to know what is moving through us and, and what is wholesome. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it, was a, it was a Vipassana class or um, right. retreat, Goenka, yeah. and I did find that the rigidity became counterproductive at a certain point. So I'm, I've been really excited finding this Sangha and the, the alternate truth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have known so many people who have had unbelievable benefit um, in those practices. And yes, they are, they're a very specific way. And um, yeah, it's, it's good to find our way. Apparently, according to the traditions, there's 10,000 forms of meditation. So probably one works for each of us, let's hope. So great questions. Wonderful to hear from folks. I'm going to uh, paste into here our slogan for the evening and share a couple reflections on this. So our slogan for the evening is don't malign others. And again, if there's folks here for the first time, we are making our way through these 59 slogans. Really beautiful. The idea here is that each of these phrases gives us an opportunity to turn our mind. So the way that we see the world, it's so habitual. It's so hard for us to actually really even recognize some of the ways that we continue to move away from that which would bring us closer to our deeper nature. And we especially get caught in these habits, of course, of egoic clinging. And the slogans, a lot of them help point out the areas where we're stuck, and they also invite this quality of transformation. So what Chandra and I have been balancing in these Wednesday evenings is this, how are we able to start refining our attention to notice the ways we get caught? So that's settling the mind in its natural state. And then have these, these kind of tools and skills to transform. So those are traditionally the Tonglen practices, those practices of compassion where we turn towards what is hard and difficult and we actually invite it closer to us. And with intention, with the open heart, we transform it. So we're in our first part here of just identifying. So don't malign others. And again, a lot of this language might feel archaic because it is. <laughs> These are ancient teachings. And yet as we pull apart the definitions and especially looking at some of the great authors who've written on this, it's very clear. Um, so I will read a little bit here. This The one way of understanding don't malign others is really helping us see that when we are talking poorly about others, it often is reflecting our inability to actually think we are okay as we are. So we look at the motivation behind gossip. We There's some parts of some types of gossip in which we are wanting to put someone else down and place ourselves up. So Chogyam Trumpa says that 
You would like to put people in the wrong by saying disparaging things. You think that your virtues can only show, um, your virtues can only show because other people's are lessened because they are less virtuous than you are. So that's kind of a pointing out of why we shouldn't malign others. Often because there's this kind of connection or desire for us to feel as though we're superior, right? There's also a way in which when um, another translation of this slogan is don't be excited by cutting remarks. So don't feed into reactionary responding. It's kind of this idea that, you know, if someone speaks poorly of us, then it's very likely that we want to speak poorly of them. But as that famous saying says, an eye for an eye, and we are all blind. And how do we not kind of respond by talking maliciously about others? I think that that is actually enormously challenging. This idea of maybe, you know, not putting down others or not poorly gossiping, okay. But if we are actually being, we, you know, talked poorly about, it's much harder. And this, of course, is circling around such an important important part of the Buddhist teaching around wise speech or right speech or virtuous speech. So I'm, I'm curious, I know there's a lot of expertise in this group. How do you guys understand wise speech? What does that mean? What does that look like for you on the day-to-day -day basis? What is, what is that? Anybody have any thoughts on wise speech? <laughs> yes, Diane says, I know what unwise speech is. Yes. And what is that? I mean, it's right. It's, it's when we are um, frivolous, harmful. Oh, Mace, I want to hear it. It's hard because this, this is a very hard slogan but for me. Because unfortunately, I quite like gossip, but um, and I also believe that it's it's related to this like you know feelings of not good enough, right? So I'm aware of that, but I do th I think I think of why why speech is you know non harming, mm -hmm. right? So if we are if the principle is always to be non harming, then so that why speech doesn't have to only be like soft and gentle and sweet um, because sometimes the non-harming thing to do is to say no right mm -hmm. um and that doesn't mean it's not wise but like the way i feel about politics i think there's a way to say no without then all the added language that i like to offer about how horrible people are <laughs> the really dehumanizing way that i speak about others that's really no different from how they speak about me mm -hmm. beautiful that's a little yeah. bit like in diane's vein of like i know what it you know i know what unwise speech is yeah 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 and i like jeremy puts here appreciation that is absolutely a wise speech and you know it's so interesting we think about what can wise speech lead to um or you know what is it a um kind of a a manifestation of and we think of appreciation being voicing appreciation, cultivating gratitude, wow, um, has so many benefits that we know of. Um, and Noam says, thinking carefully before thinking, erring on the side of not saying anything if it might be harmful. And again, such highlighting the importance of without these practices of settling the mind, how will we even know? We will be halfway through our unwise speech if we aren't really able to notice when the mind slips away, right? We, these have to go together, not just the wisdom about this, but the practice, um, non-harming, accepting others for who they are, asking questions. Eli, I love that. Yeah, right, instead of an assumption of, wow, I can't believe they did that. Gosh, they must be totally messed up or greedy or hateful or jealous, right? We, all these impositions, instead of, Huh, what's going on for you, right? So the curiosity might be the opposite of that kind of closed down view. 
Uh, Claudia saying, sometimes non-harming can be silence, active listening, respectful. Um, yes, curious, Jeremy says, versus jumping to conclusions. Uh, Walt says, consider the possible effects of your words on others before you open your mouth. Yes, and tone matters too. What good will come from what I'm about to say? Yeah. You know, and why speech, the one part about it that's so sticky is its inner speech too. <laughs> be one thing if it was just what came out of our mouth, that would be hard enough. But there is an expectation or a goal, an aspiration that this would be our inner speech too. Yeah, and you know, how do we do that? Um, yeah, I like that idea, Jeremy, of imagining hearing what you say I'm not sure if anyone has done this practice. I can't remember if we did it at the collective um, in person, but where when you do a meditation sit, instead of actually, you know, keeping all of these thoughts to yourself, you speak them out loud. And it's a very powerful practice. So you put people together and one person is sitting and meditating, the other person sitting and meditating, but actually saying what is coming to mind. It's humbling. It's really, it's really intense. And, you know, you really get, it, it, of course, there has to be some trust and build up to that, but really revealing to ourselves, what is this inner speech? It's incredibly important. Um, I want yes. To share something. Um, yeah, please. Eve, I wanted to say that uh, I'm aware of a, an unwise speech that I've done in the past and even recently where I was using somebody else's story um, to kind of uplift my contribution to a conversation where I said these things that were part of somebody else's experience and I was not aware that it would be harmful to the other person mm. when I was saying it. And I was saying it out of true like respect for that other person. I, I really enjoyed, I, I liked what they shared with me, but they didn't think that I should share it publicly. It's more mm -hmm. private for them. And so it was this weird place where I felt like in the context, it felt okay to me. Right. I wasn't thinking about the boundary of what cro what you cross when you want to say, when you're saying, sharing something that is not yours to share. And and I think that sort of value is something I, I need to, I need an extra dose of like ethic mm. in my speech because I could just, I could do those things without even realizing, you know, and I, and I need, I need help with that. So I'm, I'm kind of glad this, this slogan is really pertinent. Yeah. And thank you for, um, yeah, for that transparency. Right. And it, and when you say I need help, um, I do think, you know, Chogyam Trumpa among any of uh, many other teachers would say step one is uh, in some ways not confessional in the way that we think of being absolved, but um, confession in order to be, you know, seen, right, by yourself, by Sangha, and to say, wow, I, yeah, I need help with this. So thank you for that and, and sharing that. And I do think, just as you're pointing out, our ethics have to include the well-being of everyone. And the, you know, the kind of shorthand definition of, of wise speech, you know, it really is um, speech that, you know, has to give, gives rise to happiness for ourselves and for others. That's great, you know, so that's the wise speech. And happiness, of course, here, we're not talking about just hedonic pleasure and enjoyment because, oof, gossip feels good, doesn't it? Mace, can I get a witness? Yes. We're talking about the kind of happiness that is that deep-seated contentment, right? That is that, that feeling and that sense that we are in alignment with our, with our virtues. So what is the kind of speech that gives rise to that kind of happiness? for ourselves and for others. And um, I will say, <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. Some of you know, I, of course, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a deep fan and student um, and sharing with you all in the Dharma. And I definitely have my, my interests in psychology and neuroscience. And I happen to know that there's an incredible body of research on gossip. And I, I thought it, was, it would be worth sharing with you all a bit on what we know about gossip. 
So that's not what the slogan says because I don't think that word really existed. Um, I'm not sure the actual origin of the word gossip itself. I should look that up at some point. But the definition that's often used in psychology is, uh, this is technical, but I'll paste it in the chat here too. Here we go. So it is sharing evaluative information about an absent third party that the sender would not have shared if the third party were present. Mm. I like just that part, right? When we are gossiping, we are saying something we would not say in the presence of that person. Very, and I think that's actually, when we think of what can help us evaluate, are we gonna engage in wise speech or not? That simple consideration, would I say this if this person were in the room? And if not, why, <laughs> right? Because then the rest of the, um, the rest here is that and which according to the sender is valuable. So the person who is gossiping, we could say gossiper, but they're being very kind here. According to the sender is valuable because it adds to the current knowledge of the receiver. So there is this part here, and this has been demonstrated that the belief of evolutionary psychology is that gossip and the reason it, there's a huge ubiquity of gossip in certain studies have really discovered through observation that about 60 to 70% of conversation is talking about third parties who are not present. Hmm. Wow. That's a lot, that is. right? Yeah. 60 to 70%. Um, so we can, of course, evaluate this for ourselves in our own conversation. Um, and that was, I will say there's an updated study that was a kind of a, a landmark study in 1994 that is pretty well known. And one of the reasons that the kind of hypothesis of why it's so common, right, because this has been demonstrated, is that gossip really actually has important functions and it had functions in our environment of evolutionary adaptedness that sometimes this you know, negative gossip, meaning that person, they did something wrong. It's helpful for maintaining some social control in small groups, right? In our, in these, you know, when we were living in these smaller communities in which we literally relied upon one another, though we still do, of course, but we kind of more tangibly relied upon one another. If someone wasn't doing their part, they weren't showing up, that could threaten everybody's survival. So that this negative gossip actually helped so that you knew that if you didn't do your part, so it would be found out, right? There's like a, a, a mechanism of social control there. And also that there's, it's important to collect information that is, has what's called a fitness related value. So that we know, you know, a little bit more about other people, whether they have kind of lived up to expectations, whether they have kind of vitality and strength, should we collaborate with them? Are they reliable? One of my favorite descriptions I have to say <laughs> about gossip was that um, gossip in humans is what grooming is to primates. So gossip in humans is what grooming is. <laughs> which I think is just interesting. So its primary purpose is to establish and maintain alliances with other group members who might be important sources of support against potential future threats. Um, and so, I, you know, when we think of this grooming habits of primates, and probably most of you have seen this in a zoo or in another context, what we know about it, which is similar to gossip, is there's actually an endorphin release. So it feels good. Right, when we are, you know, and it feels good, not just in the sense of, ha ha, I know something and I'm sharing it and it's, you know, defaming someone else, but it feels good because it helps social connection. So there's a way in which the sharing of information is kind of a sharing. So grooming has a really important quality among primates. Grooming really helps kind of maintain the health of your pelt, right? Get those little bugs and other things out of there. And the idea here is that gossip, you know, also is helping us in some evolutionary way. 
So, okay, there's healthy aspects to gossip, right? There's some ways it has a social function. It's enormously prevalent. Now, what I think is interesting is there's a, a recent a study that was done in 2020, or it was published in 2020 at least, and it uses this amazing technology that again, I think if we were all really dedicated on our path and we really wanted to get, you know, just kind of get on our own case and understand ourselves, we might all volunteer to be part of a study like this. This study uses a technology that's called EAR, electronically activated recorder. Maybe some of you have heard of it. So it kind of like sits on you and it's, it randomly samples throughout the day when you're talking. So in this study, the way it randomly sampled was about 12% of your talking material. So imagine if throughout the day, 12% of the time you were talking, it just took that material. And then, you know, it looked at the content, what was being said. And in this case, they were really interested in, in gossip. And, you know, what they found, which is interesting, I mean, this is a huge study. Um, they did it with over, I think it was 600 participants. Um, and they did a relatively good job in terms of recruiting a big enough diverse sample so they could see that um, in general, right, when they compared to these qualities and characteristics that people who gossiped tended to be more extroverted. That's not surprising. Um, and women engaged in more neutral gossip than men. I like that because it goes against what most people kind of anecdotally think. So there's a lot of neutral gossip, right? And when we, when we say neutral gossip, it's more information sharing and less defaming, less kind of putting someone down or speaking negatively of them might be true. Again, we might be saying these things that are true. Um, there was younger people tended to negatively gossip more than older people. Okay, I'm gonna put no value judgment on that. Um, and then that in general, across these different characteristics, across gender, across age, that gossip actually tended to be a lot more neutral rather than positive or negative. Um, and a lot of it was about social information. So I was thinking about this myself. I had the opportunity to take a social distance walk with an old friend last night. And we have a common friend um, who I no longer am in touch with and who I lost touch with. And of course these things these things happen and I asked, I was asking the friend like, how is she, you know, what's going on? And that's like that, there could have been a lot of different ways that conversation went. I'm very fortunate. She is a, a spiritual friend and very conscious and aware of the dynamics of sharing information. And she shared beautiful, what she, sh what she shared with me. She was intentional, kind of gave me a little update and what it did for me was really fill my heart with compassion for this person, really thinking about them and uh, wishing them well. And uh, I actually shared with her, you know, I'm actually giving a talk on gossip tomorrow night. <laughs> How did that feel for you? Um, and she said, you know, I was nervous. I, I don't want to speak poorly about this person who we both love and care about. Um, and she's having a hard time. And she said, I checked in with my intention and before I spoke. So that was obviously one example, it happened beautifully, but I, I think it's interesting that this idea we can have a kind of a neutral gossip and that neutral gossip doesn't happen on accident. It happens with intention. So this important like value of gossip, right? Like that we can share information that's, that's wise actually, that might even be virtuous one other key aspect of gossip for it to be wholesome is that we have to recognize that whoever it is we're kind of you know gossiping about we can't we can't forget the view of impermanence we can't kind of imagine that everything is fixed and unchanging we can't have an idea that the person we are gossiping about is always this way or that way or another so we're talking about actions and behaviors, not a person. So that was my, my best attempt or understanding it. How could we possibly engage in, in wholesome conversation about others? 
because we look at this slogan of don't malign others, if we interpret it to be don't gossip, well, good luck, <laughs> right? If the studies are even close to what's real, we are gossiping all the time. So how do we bring this into our conscious awareness, into our dharma? How do we bring this intention of, okay, well, I don't, I don't wanna rely upon putting others down to feel good. I don't wanna be reactionary. Um, how do I apply kind of an intentional way of talking about others? It's unreasonable to put an expectation on ourselves. Well, I'm just, I just won't talk about other people at all. That probably isn't helpful because we think of, you know, there was actually another um, piece I read that I thought was interesting. It was, a, it was a kind of sociology of gossiping. And they were looking at ways in which gossip doesn't happen where it should. So we think of someone like, um, Weinstein. And, you know, many people knew about all of his transgressions before he, you know, had any consequences to it. So how do we have the gossip that needs to be heard transmitted into the right places and done so skillfully? I think all of us have had to um, do this with one another, right? We, we say, oh, you know, you know, this person, I'm thinking about working with them. What do you think? If we just said don't malign others means I can't talk poorly, my gosh, we will not be a very good friend at all. We'll just list off qualities that are okay and, and really miss out on important information. So I, I actually really appreciated this slogan for giving us this offer, opportunity to see how can we fit these kind of idealistic slogans sometimes into our everyday life. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the chat here. Walt says, isn't collective gossip the basis of religious and ethnic bigotry? Yes, makes you feel you're better than entire swaths of, of humanity, right? So that would be a gossip that was, um, I'm not even sure if we could, it's definitely gossip. And it's also, you know, there's another stronger term for it. Um, It's eluding me right now, but there's, you know, the way in which we have to kind of propagate hatred also happens through social gossip, right? Those people are terrible. Yeah, they, you know, they don't belong here for whatever reason. Absolutely. Um, and then I admit I rely on gossip often as a tool for connection with others, especially with coworkers. Yes. I experience ambivalence sometimes because when I don't engage, I feel at loss for another way to connect over a shared experience in a more positive way. This is a skill I'd like to cultivate. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I know I've mentioned this here before, but there's just amazing research showing that the people in a given workplace, in this case, in a, a large hospital who have more cynicism meaning you know, there's more cynical behavior, more cynical um, expression, they actually spend more time together. So if you survey an entire hospital and you look at the people of the highest level of cynicism and who actually knows each other and are close contacts. So you can kind of create these clusters of cynicism, but even if it's not that level, the way that most people do bond, especially in a work setting, is through gossip, often venting gossip, negative gossip. And the one thing, especially when I was doing my work with the Greater Good Science Center in, in hospital settings, one thing we really intend to do is how do we create pro-social gossip? Gratitude, appreciation, awe. What happened today that elicited awe? What happened today that was gratitude? You don't do that every time because people will think you're annoying, but to like, you know, put those in here and there and really cultivate those other um, maneuvers. Claudia. Yeah, I was just going back to the uh, example that you gave of Weinstein. And I'm just wondering, I mean, okay, the slogan says we shouldn't speak poorly of people, but in order to really avoid those transgressions that you were talking about, then how do you address that? I mean, how do you discern whether, I mean, maybe like sharing the facts of like being, trying to be more objective of maybe giving the 
positive and negative about that person or how will you approach it? I mean, I, uh, it's, it's a little, yeah, it sounds I mean, challenging to me. Right. And that's, and I'm, I'm glad you're pointing that out. I, I really think this is the clear demonstration that this slogan can't mean never speak poorly. And it actually gives us this opportunity to look closely at gossip and to see that sometimes it has a very important evolutionary function and present day function to transmit information. And, you know, I think about it, I, I'm not a journalist, but I imagine journalists rely on gossip, right? In order to uncover, you know, whistleblowers could consider that gossip, right? In a way, it's this social information that's getting passed along and passed along. And how do we find out about corruption at high government levels? Often it's gossip, right? So really important value. Again, keeping in mind is um, how do we orient ourselves to our to our own and others' well-being, and having that be kind of a really reflexive way that we're evaluating. And a comment that I just wanted to make: I I had never thought about it as you said as a the social function of gossip. Uh, as a means of control. Um, I lived in Egypt for a year, years ago, and women were always very worried or really careful about keeping their um, prestige or their, uh, yeah. Uh, and and uh, I was wondering why, why were they so so worried about their image, you know? And apparently it's because I found out that if they wanted to get married, for example, uh, whoever was interested in them would find out about them, about their, what is, uh, well, yeah, about their, not just their personality, but their background and their behavior or whatever through third parties. Yeah. So that was a function in a way of gossip and of mm -hmm. keeping them really under control yeah in a way it was wow yeah never, it sounds, never it sounds limited to me yeah. yeah very very much so right and that's that kind of knife's edge there and um yeah and i i appreciate this consideration here too of objective and subjective right with our um with our gossip sometimes there's clear facts like, wow, this is embezzlement. There's no two ways about it, right? And sometimes it's not so clear. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of gray area for us there. Oh, wow, I wanted us to do one more practice. We've had such good conversation um, here. Well, I'll give us just a minute or two to kind of let this marinate. Um, so finding our way back to this posture of dignity, brightness, clarity, as well as ease and relaxation. And maybe taking a moment and considering, has there been a time recently in which we've engaged in the kind of gossip that was possibly not so wholesome. That was not the wise speech we aspire to. And here, gently, kindly, we, we look back on this past behavior. And considering what did it feel like to share this, maybe there was a sense of momentary enjoyment. And considering again with kindness towards ourself and this past behavior, how we acted is not who we are, but considering and allowing, opening up to what impact or harm it may have created.
And maybe as you notice and bring to mind this memory, there's an experience in the body, maybe a heat, maybe a heaviness. Notice the impact of recognizing what it's like when we fall out of wise speech, when we unintentionally can contribute to harm. And without diminishing or trying to allow or make okay this unwise speech in the past, opening up some space in our heart, a compassionate holding, a forgiveness. And approaching this past falling out of wise speech, this regrettable moment or episode and the harm it may have caused. Approaching it with this ideal, this aspiration of transforming. With our next breath, we will inhale or invite this recognition, of our own harm, this sense of responsibility. And with our exhale, extending out a dedication of care and compassion and of forgiveness for ourselves. Inhale, drawing in with this clear, sober seeing. Exhale, extending out a care, a release. And then gently shifting our sphere of care and concern and considering the harm that may have been caused. We now extend a wish of compassion to that person or persons for whom we engaged in this episode of unwise speech. So having first really attended to and opened our heart to ourself we now make space fully and openly to this other party. So inhale, bringing to mind this person or persons and not again allowing or making okay whatever their transgression may have been that we were speaking about, but recognizing that this person just like us wants to be free wants to be happy, wants to avoid pain. That this person is occasionally out of alignment, maybe often, but there are parts of this person that are good, that are wholesome. That this being is ever changing, just like us, making mistakes, learning, hopefully growing, so with this compassionate seeing, we bring this person to mind through our inhale. And through our exhale, sending them care, kindness. May they find their way. May they know peace. May they experience the ease of belonging and love. Again, this may be a person who has done harm and is hurtful. We're not condoning or allowing that. We are inviting, however, the possibility that this person is multidimensional and that they can change. And we extend out that compassionate wish. May they find that change. May they know peace. May they feel ease.
And then extending this heart of compassion and forgiveness. Imagine it is as wide and as vast as the ocean, that it could absorb all of the waves, all of the tumult. And then we could invite and include an aspiration of forgiveness for all beings, that they would know the sweetness of self-forgiveness, that they would know the power of forgiving others. May all beings know compassion. May all beings know ease. May all beings experience belonging and freedom. Thank you all for your practice. Really wonderful discussion and conversation tonight. Next week, Chandra will be leading Feeding Your Demons. So get those demons ready <laughs> for the good transformation. And um, yeah, wonderful to see you all. And absolutely. Keep on coming, keep on doing your work. Beautiful to be together. Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you, Eve. Thank you, Eve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> Night, everyone.